So do we have all the speakers here? Uh, Dr. B. Vijay Lakshmi. Okay, you will be speaking first. And I would like to invite all our uh, panelists. Uh, chairperson Dr. Seema Benswaroop. Co-chairperson Ramesh Bobli. Convener Arindam Ar Ar Arvind Roy. Co-convener Subhajit Chakravarti. And moderate myself. And Anu Malik. Okay. Uh, AV team, ma'am, ka pipit do. Sorry for the hit. So I'll be speaking about the management of corneal uh, corneal ulcer for general ophthalmologists. What basically they have to see and when they have to refer uh, to a cornea specialist. So we'll be speaking little uh, little about the definition positive organisms, investigations, management, and follow-up, and especially when to refer. By definition, corneal ulcer means disruption of the epithelium with infiltration of the stroma. Most of the ulcers in India are bacterial, contributing around more than 60%. The next comes fungal, which contribute close to 30%. Remaining are parasitic and mixed infection. There are two key steps in managing an ulcer. One is thorough history taking, which is often neglected, and a slit lamp, thorough slit lamp examination is very important in follow-up of the ulcer. Bacterial ulcers are most common. Some of them, like GPC, uh, are uh, sometimes even clinically we can pick them up, like they are very roundish and uh, grayish infiltrate. And GNB is very progressive uh, ulcer, which progresses very fastly and also may have a very typical per presentation. Uh, a ring infiltrate is usually seen in acanthamoeba keratitis, and uh, a wreath shape of infiltrate is usually seen in nocardia keratitis. But sometimes the clinical guessing might be very difficult. Like this is a case of a fungal er keratitis, which is having a feathery uh, margins with a dry looking ulcer. Same thing which closely mimics is a pythium keratitis, which has a totally different type of treatment which has to be given. I'm uh, just showing this just to say that sometimes even in the best of best eyes and best of best hands, it's very difficult to just clinically look at it and pinpoint, uh, the, dia pinpoint the etiological agent causing the ulcer. There are four mandatory investigations every ulcer patient have to undergo. That is a random blood sugar to rule out any di uh, uncontrolled or diabetes, early diabetes. Uh, a syringing to know the patency of the sac, especially in GPC ulcers, sometimes the sac is giving up the organism and uh, that is the source of infection. A B-scan ultrasonography is must whenever you are not able to see the fundus to rule out any posterior segment involvement. Corneal scaping is mandatory um, because it will tell you whether you are going in the right direction or not. Since my other colleague is uh, telling it in detail, I am not going into the details. The three questions which you have to uh, answer when you are managing are what medications which you have to start, how to follow up, and when to refer. Usually we do a combination therapy. We start with fortified antibiotics. The preferred fortified antibiotics is fortified sapazoli with moxifloxin or ciprofloxin. The disadvantage is fortified antibiotics have a shorter shelf life. You have to remix and give it to the patient. Or sometimes if it's a very small infiltrate, we start with early single antibiotic. But sometimes we might miss out on uh, coverage of all the organism. There are two phases in healing of the ulcer, which is the phase one, which is a sterilization of the cornea, where you are giving an intensive treatment where you want the organisms to be uh, eliminated. And next is once, the, once it starts scarring and you know that the response, you are getting into a healing phase, you are limiting the inflammatory response and super added infection. As I told you before, fortified antibiotics are the treatment of choice. In cases of bacterial ulcer, the most commonly used is fortified sapazolin, which is uh, in the dosage of 50 milligram per ml. In fungus, we use usually natamycin and acanthamoeba, chlorhexidine and PHMB. Three important adjuvant medications which we use are cycloplegics, namely atropine or homotropine. Antiglocma medications are optional and especially useful when you digitally feel there is a high IOP, especially seen when there is a lot of hypopure and oral analgesics. 
at presentation it is important to pick up a severe inf uh, infection suppose there is a 6 mm infiltrate more than more thinning you have and if you are seeing a perforation you have to immediately refer the patient if there is no perforation you can start the patient on hourly drops day and night and then follow him up suppose the infection is not very severe then just start the patient on op basis hourly drops initial review should always be early it should be around 40 within 48 hours and scarring is the most important clue which you will be looking out along with the other signs of subjective improvement and also reducing the size of epithelial defect and infiltrate. In the early review, you have to look for if there is any perforation, then urgent referral as, as uh, said. If there is no um, perforation, then you have to check for the cultures. You get the sensitivity report for early sensitivity report within 48 hours and check whether you are using the sensitive drop. If you are not using the sensitive drop, then make sure that you are shifting the uh, patient to the sensitive drop. Then if, if the patient is still uh, using the sensitive drop and it's not healing, please exclude a poor compliance. In one week review, just make sure that there is no progression and uh, if there is uh, culture negative, then stop the medication and refer. If uh, it's culture positive, again you have to check for the sensitivity and then uh, you have to restart the medication according to the sensitivity. In one week review, you have to make sure that uh, there is, uh, is there a partial or a incomplete uh, resolution and if at all there is poor compliance, make sure you admit the patient and keep the patient under close observation. In uh, Suppose the patient has a very slow healing, always make sure that you repeat the corneal scraping to rule out any super added infections. Sometimes you might even have to do a corneal biopsy in cases of a deeper thing which is better done by a cornea specialist. In fungal keratitis, we usually start with 5% uh, natamycin and in case of non-healing, we go for intrastomal and intracameral voriconazole and in non-responding cases, we go for TPK. You have to always rule out for other causes of non-healing ulcers like poor compliance and associated chronic dactrocystitis, dry eye, etc. Always, uh, uh, in summary, I would like to say that corneal scraping is a must in case of corneal ulcer to know about the etiology, RBS syringing are mandatory in all cases. In case of bacterial, it's better to start with a uh, combination therapy with fortified antibiotics. Close follow-up to pick up thinning and non-healing ulcer is very important. And prompt referral in case of perforation and large ulcers is very important. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vijayalakshmi. Uh, it's not easy to summarize in seven minutes. And uh, it was a good, we'll, we'll revisit many of these concepts. May I request Dr. Divya to be ready with her slides and Raful, any questions from yeah, in the meantime, in the meantime. Uh, thank you, Dr. Vijaya, for quoting my article, <laughs> <laughs> the survey article. And uh, one thing, see, the, the general ophthalmologist always has a dilemma, what to start. You know? mm. Preparing concentrated drops is not an easy task. Most of us, they, most of them, they avoid. So what is your uh, suggestion to them? If you do, uh, don't have uh, uh, to prepare concentrated drops, what should they start with? Sir, um, a broad spectrum uh, fluoroquinolone can be started, but I would always say that uh, preparing a fortified antibiotic is not a big task for someone who has but done. But he was noting head yes, yes, we don't want to prepare concentrated drops. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there are issues it's very with compounding fortified, pharmacy. Uh, but, uh, fortified yeah. sofazolin uh, comes in an injection of 500 mg or 1000 mg milligram. What you have to do is just take a mellows bottle. If it's 500 mg, add those 10 ml of mellows and then put it back in the mellows bottle. If it's a thousand mg, put two ml of two bottles of mellows into that injection. Give it in two bottles. Sir, that much only yeah. you have to do. You can you can train your assistant to do it. Any optometrist or, or your theater yeah. assistant. If you have if if you are dealing with keratitis too often, it's always to make a chart and yeah. paste it there. That will help you. If still you don't want to prepare, the ideal is whatever ma'am said. Go for high percentage fluoroquinolones. Like don't go for the uh, gatifloxacin 0.3. Go for gatifloxacin 0.5 percent. Five percent. Or levofloxacin, which I think Santam has withdrawn from market, but that is also 1.5% is a good addition. So you can still go ahead with that. Thank you. Thank you. Now we welcome Dr. Divya from Vision Tree, Vishakhapatnam. Uh, good evening. Every scope of the presentation includes a background. Uh, why do we need to do a scraping, the preparation before the procedure, the procedure itself, and points to remember. So procuring the samples from the infiltrate greater than 2 mm is called as corneal scraping. It Erasmus Darwin, who is, who is the grandfather of Charles Darwin, was the first person to suggest the idea of therapeutic debridement to make the cornea clear. Then why do we need to do a corneal scraping? 
there are my many kinds of pathogens that cause corneal infections so the clinical manifestations are complex and diverse so early rapid effective diagnosis is needed so that we for so for that we do a scraping and apart from that uh, diagnosis it decreases the organism load and also help in better penetration of the drug so before going to the procedure it is always better to document the case in the form of slit lamp images and also drawings to know the progression or uh, healing of the ulcer and we should also counsel the patient regarding the need for the procedure and the steps so that it avoids un unnecessary anxiety and we should be ready with all the instruments uh, required for the procedure so we need paracrine kimura spatula 15 number blade and eye speculum optional slides cover slip 10% koh gram stain gram stains and culture media so this is a video showing the procedure we'll first instill the paracrine drops which is least bacterial static compared to others then we scrape with the sharp edge we scrape uh, the in infiltrate from the margins and the center then for the gram stain we smear the material and label the smeared area with a marker under surface and also write the patient details and the stain which to to be done on the slide itself and for koh instead of smearing we'll just tap the material and add koh and place the cover slip then we examine the slides for to find the organisms under the microscope this is a sda agar where the material is inoculated taking care that it doesn't touches the walls and in blood agar multiple c shapes are inoculated so on koh first we examine under 10x and then 40x so these are different organisms like fungal elements you can see acanthema double wall cyst and uh, it is though it is difficult we can even say a pythium which is much broader compared to fungi with uh, lesser septae in gram stain after following a proper protocol in staining we can see gram positive and gram negative bacteria along with that you can observe acanthema cyst microsporidia uh, they these appear as a uh, safety pin uh, appearance and due to the presence of polar bodies and also nocadia they appear as a no uh, beaded filaments in cultures we can see bacterial and fungal growth in an sta this is the fungal growth we, we can go with an optional medium if you suspect other organisms like meconkey if you suspect an entric organisms lowenstein jensen for mycobacterial and nnn medium with e coli if you suspect an acanthamoeba and a typical stains like acid fast and also calcofloor white gems of a fungi so this is a slide showing therapeutic debridement so corneal scraping apart from the diagnostic it can be used for therapeutic purpose to decrease the load of organism and also for better penetration so points to remember for a beginners beginners you can start with an upward stroke for better uh, collection of the material and if less material is available uh, go for grams and chocolate aga and in advanced keratitis because of the keratolysis and dermatoseal be careful not to perforate and and be ready with the glue and you may not get any organisms so in contact lens keratitis send the contact lens for culture and also the solution and the lens case to find the organisms and also the source of infection and if the keratitis is present with an intact epithelium first scrape the epithelium and de then remove the infiltrate and for deep stromal keratitis go for other methods like biopsy passing a suture lamellar flap biopsy and if the culture is negative stop the medications for 24 hours and then repeat the scraping thank you thank you dr divya so this was a very crisp summary of how from the ophthalmologist point of view what we should take care any questions to dr divya any questions from the audience thank you dr divya nice videos uh, i would appreciate that uh, one point uh, you said speculum optional so i would rather disagree with that uh, speculum should be used almost always because patients have a tendency to squeeze the moment you go in with your instrument 
So it's always better to put a speculum. Right? Actually, and we can uh, we usually use the actually we use the non-dominant hand to separate the lid because we have observed in few patients that they're feeling really uncomfortable after keeping a speculum. Right. So they're be becoming more anxious. Yeah, that's so true. So that's why I said ki as far as possible, you should be try. You should try to put a speculum. And so any other device with which somebody can uh, do this corneal scraping because at times uh, they may not have this BD handle with uh, 15 degree blade. So any other device with which corneal scraping can be done, which is readily number available. Blade. Okay, so 15 uh, number, number blade, blade can yeah. be used. used. Also at RP Center, we use 26 gauge needles. Need, yeah. you know, that also can be used. That is quite easily available. These are disposable needles. You can keep in your slit lump and you can use that. Okay. And uh, one important point is, as uh, ma'am also highlighted, please clear all the mucus, everything from the ulcer bed before going for scraping. And could you just tell them why is it important to uh, scrap from the edge as well as base? So the advancing age has the actually has the organisms multiplying. So you don't get a ne debris or necrotic material if you scrape from the advancing age, like edges. Also some organisms like why why do you scrape from the base? Then some organisms like Moraxella, you know, they are found in base only. So if you just scrape off the edge and leave the base, then you may miss such organism. And second, uh, as you I have seen that video, please don't do like this to and fro. It has to be unidirectional. Uh, okay. Uh, sorry, actually, I have uh, mentioned at the last slide that point to remember. Yeah. In order to show that for bigness, you can try in the upward direction. So I added even that also. Actually, yeah. I want to tell that that's actually wrong way to do in both directions. So only in one direction we have to. Yes, uh, it's always unidirectional, mm -hmm. and for uh, students, if you are sitting here, mm -hmm. examiner will ask you. The standard answer should be: it should be repeated unidirectional from the edge as well as base. That is the ideal description how to do scraping. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. May I invite uh, Professor Chintan Malhotra? Uh, so uh, my topic actually, I'll be speaking about HSV keratitis, uh, not viral keratitis. That was the original topic. And uh, thank you to AIOS for the opportunity. I think HV, HSV keratitis is something which perplexes many of us all the times, but it is one of the uh, most responsive keratitis and the most gratifying keratitis to treat. So we know that HSV is the omen, only known human reservoir for HSV, and because it is so ubiquitous in all of us, up to 90% of the population may be infected with latent HSV by 60 years of age. Now the clinical manifestations, again, it's important to mention here that diagnosis is mainly clinical. If you know, if you can recognize the look, HSV keratitis does not really require any investigations except the occasional PCR for keratouriitis. So it affects all layers of the cornea and going straight from the epithelium to stroma and endothelium and then also, of course, the uveal tract, the keratouriitis. Now the dendrite is the most characteristic lesion of the HSV keratitis, which has a classic branching linear pattern. If any of us see this, I think being ophthalmologists, it's not something we are going to miss. But often, especially if you're working in a secondary or tertiary hospital, you will not see this because patients, it will have resolved by the time patients come to you and you may just see some footprint scars. And this is often self-limiting. Now the other thing, the other lesions, I mean, so this is another manifestation. I want to make this presentation more photographic. So, you know, you have a patient who is presented like this, and this is a dendrogeographic lesion. There is some map-like pattern along with the geographic lesion. And if there is any confusion, the base stains with fluorescein, and the swollen edges which contain live virus stain with rose bengal, as is seen on the picture at the bottom. And in whenever we have to stain, the order should be first rose bengal, quickly followed by fluorescein, because if you stain with fluorescein first, it will diffuse into the center, and you will not be able to see the rose bengal staining. A purely geographic ulcer, which is again due to live virus, has to be differentiated from a metaherpetic or a neurotrophic keratitis, which you see in HSV. This is due to live virus. This will often have scalloped margins, which helps it to differentiate from the metaherpetic ulcer or the neurotrophic ulcer, which has smooth borders, sloping edges, and this will not and this will show the pattern of reverse staining, where the rose bengal stains the base and the uh, fluorescein is diffusing beyond the edges. Now, coming to the one which is more complicated is the stromal keratitis due to HSV. So the majority of morbidity is not due to epithelial disease or due to endothelial disease. It is due to stromal disease. Here, the immune mechanism and live virus both play a role. 
Sometimes in very fulminant cases, it's difficult to differentiate from bacterial or fungal keratitis and often the initial treatment may have to be bacterial or fungal because you can't recognize it and later on as an exclusion you think of uh, viral. And treatment has to be a fine balance between antivirals and steroids. This I'll try to demonstrate through a couple of cases. So now this is what I would call a classic case of HSV stromal keratitis. I have deliberately put up this picture because hypopion is, it's not very common, but it is not rare. You will see hypopion in sometimes in cases of HSV stromal keratitis. But what I want everybody to focus on in this area, this stromal inflammation is the hallmark of HSV stromal keratitis. And this is a form of what earlier was known as non-necrotizing stromal keratitis where there is no epithelial defect. The other form is a stromal keratitis with ulceration. Now this was a patient who was being treated with topical antibacterials and antifungals somewhere, not wrongly I would say, but the clue in this case which would give you an idea that this perhaps may be viral is the area of edema which is extending way beyond the area of the infiltrate. So that gives you an idea that there is a component of significant endothelitis as in association with the stromal keratitis as well. But while I mention this, I would like to say that think viral, but be sure to rule out bacterial and fungal. So in this case, although I would say by clinical suspicion, I was 100% sure this is viral, but I would still not take that risk, especially for the residents and fellows. You should rule out, you should scrape and send for bacterial and fungal. And if it's not just treated for two months, one more day won't make a difference. Wait for that and then you can start. So just coming to the two cases which I mentioned, this patient, if you start with systemic antivirals and steroids, this is the patient after uh, two weeks, all inflammation gone. Vision is 636, mainly due to a cataract, which improved later after cataract surgery. But again, what I would like to emphasize here is that while the infiltration has gone, if you make a slit, the edema persists. So while the edema persists, you don't need to stop treatment suddenly. You need to give treatment for a little while longer so that the both the infiltration as well as the edema goes. And in the second case, again, three days after initiation of treatment with antivirals and systemic steroids, so topical steroids were avoided here because of presence of an epithelial defect. The patient cleared up remarkably. Treatment has to be continued for a longer time. And this is what, again, I would like to mention. This is the stromal infiltration. So these are the WBCs in the stroma around the vessels. And so treatment should be continued for a longer time. If we stop it here, the infection, uh, the inflammation will continue to smolder and the patient will have chronic vascularization and later on uh, other sequelae. Then coming to, I've, I'm just keeping it to the simpler manifestations, coming to endothelial keratitis or endotheliitis, it may be disciform, it may be diffuse, or it may be linear. So this was a young girl, actually she was a 17 year old girl who was referred for OPK from outside. You know, somebody thought this is a corneal opacity and was referred. Now for all the residents sitting here, I would again like to mention any time you see a corneal opacity, what you think is a corneal opacity, be sure to please do a slit lamp examination. Look at the thickness. The thickness in the center is more than your thickness in the periphery. The thickness in the center is more than your thickness superiorly. So this is a case of endotheliitis. And this would have KPs below this if you s after you start steroids and you will see the resolving. I'm sorry, I don't have the follow-up of this. And you can use ASOC to, to see keratic precipitates. Another patient, same, this was a one-eyed lady, in fact, diffuse endotheliitis, sudden onset of edema, no history of trauma. And you see that after you've started the steroids and the antivirals, the KPs appear, and 10 days later, the cornea is much clearer, and of course, later on, treatment was continued. So in stromal disease, the inflammation is much more, whereas in endothelial disease, the edema is much more, although both can coexist. And if not adequately treated, these patients can have long-term sequelae. So you can have the steel wool keratopathy with chronic vascularization and lipid keratopathy, which is then debilitating and would need a keratoplasty, which again is a lifelong challenge. Or if in one eye you have some disease where you are confused what the other, what it could be, look at the other eye. If the other eye has these footprint scars, because we know that epithelial disease tends to alternate, if you see the footprint scar in the other eye, you would have a clue that what you are dealing with is HSV keratitis. A quick word about the treatment, epithelial disease is treated with antivirals, whether systemic or uh, topical, most often topical suffice. Stromal and endothelial disease has to be treated with a combination of antivirals and steroids. And there needs to be a fine balance depending on the manifestation. I'll just take, if you will permit me, just two more minutes, uh, not two more minutes, maybe 20 seconds more. Yeah, please go. Yeah. yeah. So if you have stromal, if the stromal inflammation is predominant, one focuses on the steroids more, associated with antivirals in a 
prophylactic dose. Steroids have to be full dose. On the other hand, if it is stromal keratitis with ulceration, which is due to live virus and immune mechanism, you initially give antivirals more, systemic and therapeutic dose, and steroids are held back a little bit. And later on, as the epithelial defect decreases, you give steroids. And finally, endotheliitis is due to both live and immune mechanism, so it has to be a balance between steroids and antivirals in full doses. And the last slide, don't underestimate the risk of excessive steroids, infections, cataract, glaucoma, but don't hesitate to use them where needed. Use the steroids for as little as possible, for as short as possible, but as much as needed and for as long as needed, and that can often have very gratifying results. Thank you. Thank you, Professor uh, Malhotra. This is uh, a very important topic in our context uh, because uh, this can very easily be secondarily infected and uh, it's not very uncommon to confuse HSV with fungus and rarely acanthamoeba because often steroids are the mainstay of treatment in HSV and they might lead to devastating consequences. So I really uh, like that slide of uh, yours where you put up the need for scraping. I think yes, that absolutely. cannot be Th underemphasized cannot anymore. Be overemphasized. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. May I invite Dr. Sudhakar? Dr. Sudhakar Naidu. Okay. okay. Then we'll move on to the to next Dr. speaker. Dr. Varsha. May I have Dr. Varsha's slides, please? Good afternoon, everyone. So this is about use of trypanloin, uh, which is used as staining in the management of infectious keratitis. We have heard since uh, the start of the session about ulcers. So this is a story of a lady who was using contact lenses, and she developed ulcer and had to undergo keratoplasty. This is another patient where uh, there was a history of injury, and it turned out to be fusory. So we know that ulcer is a silent epidemic, and now uh, the cases of uh, fungal keratitis are increasing in India and also abroad. So the, the minimal, uh, minimum annual incidence estimates are pretty high. The slides are moving on its own, I think so. Yeah. I'm not doing anything, but the slides yeah, are moving. Yeah, we have So we have heard about the corneal uh, scraping. So uh, uh, basic requirements and everything we are, we have discussed already. Uh, probably I'll and culture media probably we don't do culture media everywhere every time uh, in private clinic. General ophthalmologists won't be doing this, but I would still suggest that if you can do a smear, say 10% potassium hydroxide, or grams or ginsa, you will be able to pick up uh, organisms. And this is what is a standard practice in institutes. Uh, at rural secondary centers where we uh, have a uh, lab microscope, we are doing just 10% KOH count to see presence of fungal filaments, whether present or absent, and based on that, we would start antifungal treatment. And this is, if you see, it's very difficult to see the fungal filaments or acanthamoeba in KOH, but uh, we have done this, and we could show that, yes, it works, but it is very difficult for us to see that. Uh, KOH, anyone can prepare by dissolving a tablet in 5 cc of distilled water and you can use the KOH uh, from th these tablets. Uh, I won't go into details of this. If I show you this slide, it's very difficult, but if I magnify, you can see that. So that's how transparent the KOH mount is and it is very difficult for anyone to examine. So what we wanted was something which would highlight that, which is simple, inexpensive, easy and fast, something like this. Though we say we have gram, but the preparation of gram stain is tedious. And microbiologist is required for uh, uh, calcofluor white and uh, KOH uh, stain. So not everyone would have that. And that's when we thought of using trypan blue as a stain, which every cataract surgeon would have, and all anterior segment, cornea people are anterior segment surgeons. Trypan blue is also used to stain fungus in plants, and this is very old article. This was during COVID when we had a patient at one of our rural centers and we didn't have KOH and she had symptoms of two months. Uh, she presented with an infiltrate and what we did was a uh, trypan blue staining and we could see uh, fungal filaments. But the fellow who was working there was very disturbed that we have used this and the patient was referred when the lockdown was not there and uh, fungus was found to be present there. 
and she was treated anyway with antifungals based on her first dressing. So we did a comparison of Trypan Blue and KOH calcoflavoid stain for the diagnosis of uh, microbial keratitis at tertiary center. And we have used this. Uh, what we use here is, I'm just showing you the Trypan Blue staining where you can see the fungal filaments, acepted broad thin walled filaments with ribbon-like folds which are seen after three days. So even if you keep this light for three days, you can use that, uh, you can see the fungal filaments. And also you can see the epithelial cells and polymorpha nuclear cells there. If you add Tupan Blue to KOH, you would see crystallization. So it will be very difficult for you to see that. Uh, with, uh, when you mix it with glycerol, it forms a smooth blue solution emulsion. So against that, it is very easy for you to see the fungal filaments. The intra-observer and inter-observer uh, agreement was excellent. And also the specificity, which was 97% uh, in this. Uh, these are the various organisms uh, on culture, and uh, we could say that 90% were positive on KOH calcofloor white, and 84% uh, were positive on Trypan blue stain. So sensitivity and specificity was manageable here, and we could show that, yes, we can use that uh, Trypan blue stain. Uh, we also could see Pythium, as you can see here, <coughs> the Pythium on Trypan blue. And this is another case for the same. So if you see the fungal filaments, these are thin and septed. You can see the septa here. And these are the fungal uh, pythium, which is broad and aseptic. So you can differentiate this on Trypan blue stain. So if you s have a small ulcer as a general ophthalmologist or as a cornea person, or you would like to do that, you can just do clinical evaluation, do a direct microscopy. Even if you don't have any KOH or any other stain, you can use Trypan blue, what you have in your OR, uh, usually we use the one which is not, uh, we use uh, one Trypan blue for one case, so the remaining Trypan blue, whatever is left over, we are using it for staining the uh, slides. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Varsha. I think uh, uh, necessity is the mother of invention, so Absolutely. anything that is uh, used and can be used in resource limited settings is extremely useful. Thank so you. very innovative concept. Thank you very much. Thank May I invite uh, Dr. Srinivas Prasad? Yeah, most of the times, uh, wherever I go, I discuss basics only. I don't want to do anything extraordinary. But what are the basics an ophthalmologist should know when he's seeing a corneal infiltrate? So as is mentioned in the books, should ask the history properly. So is it painful or the intensity of the pain? How is it? Any discharge is there? How much is the redness? What's the duration? So these are the basic things most of the times we don't ask. Just we see the infiltrate and try to go about it. But history taking is very, very important. And as I told you, when there is an infiltrate, what will happen to the vision? All those things you should predict and try to treat the cases. And how much duration is there? Is it a short time duration or the duration is more? Then if the duration is more, then what could be the infiltrate? Is it an infective one? Is it a bacterial one or a fungal one? Like that, you have to analyze and go about the case. And again, recurrent history. Is it there a recurrent attack? So what's the relevance of a recurrent attack? Is it the first attack or the recurrent attack? What's the relevance of that? So that's why, as the first speaker has mentioned, history taking is very, very important. And then you go about the examination and try to do, analyze the infiltrate. Then you think of the investigations which you would like to do. Then what are the, is it uh, all case of any surgery has been done or previous surgery has been done? Because most of the times after surgery, most of the patients, they continue the drugs like that, even after cataract surgery. So what will happen? So you should ask all those things, then you go about treating that case. So general condition also, and also the local examination is very, very important. What are the lead conditions, where the infiltrate can come, any mevomitis is there, all those things, these are all basics, which most of the times we lose it because we don't go into it. So if you, based on that, if you go about it, you can analyze your diagnosis and try to come to a conclusion, even if your microbiology support is not there. 
so the type of defect where it is is it inferior or superior or any lag of thalamus is there all those things these are all clinical acumen which you develop slowly and unless you have interest in analyzing a treaty to treat a keratitis it's not very easy just you just give drugs a cocktail of drugs no you're supposed to think of it see the local condition see the recurrence rate is it a small infiltrate or a big infiltrate what's the duration of the epithelial defect all these things you come take in history and try to analyze it so when there is an epithelial defect is it paracentral or inferior why i'm telling in the all these things is most of the times these are very important and these are the basic things should be followed when you are seeing a keratitis case <coughs> and how about the edema is it epithelial or stromal or deep seated so if it is edema is deep seated most probably the infiltrated is deep or it can be a viral origin so whenever you analyze a finding you are supposed to analyze it try to analyze it and try to come to a conclusion about the infective pathology that is lingering there and depth most important times is very depth so if it is rapidly progressing one and it's a deep neg one if it's a gram negative one it may perforate so all these things you analyze very well then if the infiltrate is very dense can i do a scraping on that and where will i scrape as the previous mention speaker has mentioned that we have to go for the advancing edge or the base and how do you scrape it single stroke a unidirectional stroke which blade is used everything is very very important to take a scraping <coughs> and there is an indistinct margin you try to go for the advancing edge where you may get the infiltrate where the bacterial load is more and if it is feathery and dry and discharge is less long duration then it may be fungal so when you take proper history then you take the scraping and try to go take the support of microbiology to come to the conclusion what type of infiltrate is lingering there and as previous speaker told us about hsv i don't want to go deep but what are the manifestations it may be epithelial it can be stromal or <coughs> endothelial so infective keratitis even disciform so when you see an infective keratitis which is viral whether you go for a topical or steroid combination all those things you analyze the infiltrate is it a disky form or anything whether to start steroid or not so all those things you will be apprehensive so you are supposed to be sure what to start and is it a necrotizing one or an old one whether it is is it a scar is it quiet will you start treatment or not and whenever you are seeing a hsv case you are supposed to see as a systemic infection it's not a local infection so it's a systemic infection and unless you treat it properly with systemic medications they may go in for uh, post herpetic neuralgia so whenever you are seeing hsv you are supposed to think on the lines this is a system disease and you are supposed to treat it like a systemic disease and what antivirals you will start and if you start it within 72 hours only it will be useful <coughs> so again you may get pseudo dendritic keratitis also you should try to rule out is it a pseudo dendritic or a true true dendritic and also when there is uveitis can it be a uveitis because of hsv and as i told you these are the long term durations where it has healed very well and because of neurotropic mechanism there will be a epithelial defect its own needs observation you need not treat it actively but you are supposed to give a supportive treatment so that the epithelial defect will heal and sabath nowadays we are seeing lot of cases and different type of keratitis so sometimes you are seeing microsporidias also so do you want any systemic treatment like deworming or anything in microsporidias you are supposed to think on those lines and adenoviral has become quite common and it is seeing lot of cases after conjunctivitis you are seeing adenoviral when to start steroid how long you want to give steroid how much time you to want to give topical steroids especially in adenoviral which has become quite recurrent most of the times we are seeing recurrent adenoviral infiltrates <coughs> acanthamoeba is quite rare and when you have a system where the diagnostics to diagnose acanthamoeba keratitis is very tough but it depends upon your clinical acumen and the drug availability to treat acanthamoeba keratitis is very tough phmb chlorexamine is not available at your drug stores you have to refer it to higher institutes thank you thank you dr prasad i think uh, it's a very relevant discussion because i think this is the third time during in the session where we are emphasizing that there is a very significant history taking that is important 
and there is uh, an importance of understanding each of the subtle signs and also in Professor Malhotra's talk, HSV, again, a very common disease, and yet it is primarily diagnosed clinically. So, uh, so I think the message that goes from the discussion is that microbiology will be an ancillary. It, it, but now what we are seeing gradually is that it is the primary way in which we treat, and then we go back and revisit the ulcer. Uh, but I'm very sorry to say, even, even in tertiary, places, having a good microbiology, especially ocular microbiology service is a luxury. Not, not really a lot of people can have it. So the clinician is very much in the center of things. And I think uh, each and every subtle sign, the history uh, adds to one more point that helps us towards the diagnosis. Uh, sorry for this rather long winding note, but uh, I think uh, we can have well a discussion. Just to summarize this. what yeah. sir is saying. There is a study in uh, uh, American Academy of Ophthalmology published where they reviewed how many percent of cases a clinician can predict accurately what is the cause of uh, keratitis. And in that 70 percent uh, physician, they could perfectly guess simply based on the clinical signs, it, it whether it is bacterial or it is fungal or it may be some atypical organism. So trust your clinical skill and follow whatever sir just summarized in this basic presentation. If you remember those, you can easily diagnose microbial keratitis. Thank yeah. you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. May I invite Dr. Riku Nagpal? Uh, Dr. Riku Nagpal is not there. Uh, do we have Dr. Mohammad Arif? Yeah, yeah please. Yeah. Surgical management may be after sir's talk, we can have a simple five-minute panel discussion because that is a very important mm -hmm. part of uh, microbial keratitis basics. So we'll discuss that among ourselves. Basically, I'll be uh, dealing with the fungal keratitis update. So uh, I'll be talking about uh, the fungal keratitis in these outlines, like in the epidemiology causative agent, agent, clinical features, diagnostic modalities, and treatment options. So uh, basically, epidemi epidemiology is very varied. It is strongly associated with geographical location, and it is widely varied throughout the world, and even between the different regions of the same country. Like uh, in um, in India itself, if, if you take the uh, causative organisms in uh, north and south, the uh, fusarium dominates in the south and aspergillus dominates in the north. And this is the uh, 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 estimated prevalence of uh, fungal keratitis in the various countries, in which uh, most of the countries which have more agriculture-based economies have more fungal keratitis than uh, the countries which are not dependent on that. And India, we have an uh, 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 estimated prevalence of close to 35%. And it might even be more because the kind of uh, reporting uh, at a very uh, primary level might not be happening. And the basic risk factors which we uh, deal with the fungal keratitis are mainly a trauma with vestigial or soil matter in developing nations and contact lens use in ocular surface disease in developed nations. And the most common age group that comes in uh, yeah, that uh, experiences fungal keratitis is 20 to 50 years. And males are more common to be affected by fungal keratitis than females. And we have actually 63 different genera of fungi which can affect fungi. Uh, uh, the eye, and the most common being this, the one which have been highlighted, Fusarium, Aspergillus, and Cavalieria, and Pencilium, which are the filamentous fungi, and the yeasts. And filamentous fungi are more common in tropical regions, and temperate regions, we have more of yeast. This is how, this is, these are the organisms which are more commonly found in our country, where uh, these are the percentages which uh, they affect. And this actually is a, a, a study which shows uh, 30 years estimated, uh, uh, the, 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 what do you call the, uh, the estimated prevalence of uh, fungal keratitis in various conditions. Like the in clinical suspected cases, we can see the uh, it ranges around 23%. Uh, and in clinically suspected fungal keratitis, where the relation of the pretty short is around 43%. And in pediatric patients, it's around 15%. And like the symptoms and all were discussed by the earlier speaker. And the signs were, uh, the typically the fungal keratitis usually is dry looking uh, ulcer, which is elevated with uh, irregular margins. And uh, many of them, you have these uh, uh, satellite lesions, and uh, you can have these uh, pigmented lesions uh, when you have an infection by dermatitis fungi. And the presence of endothelial plaques and fixed hypopion are also more um, suggestive of fungal keratitis. And like Sir uh, mentioned earlier also, the history taking and clinical examination most of the times works uh, around 70% of accuracy. And the most common method of identifying a fungus is uh, through the coronal scraping and culture identification. And these are the other modalities like confocal microscopy, PCR, metagenomic deep sequencing, proteomic analysis, and uh, mass spectrometry. 
and generally the specimen which most commonly is used for the microscopic examination is coronal scraping and when the infection is very deep we can go for a coronal biopsy and whenever we sub sub uh, subject coronal biopsy for uh, staining we can also do a histopathology to identify the organism at which level it is and when uh, in difficult condition we can use a suture or uh, use the suture biopsy contact lens and solution the most commonly used staining is 10% uh, koh and most of the times in institute is combined with calclovite and these are the other stains like Grams, Jimsa, uh, GMS, and lactophenol, cotton blue, and uh, periodic acid shift. This is how the fungal filaments would look in a KOH mount. And this one is one in the Grams. And this is how these uh, fungal filaments would irradiate in uh, 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 calcofluor white under a phase contrast microscope. The culture is the most gold standard uh, in diagnosis, uh, the gold standard in diagnosis fungal keratitis. And it is highly specific as we can uh, identify the species level. And the commonly used media are uh, potato directors are SDA, chocolate agar, and triglyceride agar. And uh, when uh, most of the fungal uh, uh, infiltrates would, would sorry fungal um, uh, infl uh, fungal growth would take around seven days. And to discard that is no good. We should at least wait for two weeks. And the fungus should grow at least in two solid media, and it should have a semi-confined growth at the inoculation site. And the fungus that has grown in the media and on the slide should correspond. And uh, the culture, uh, it is very important because now, uh, because of the emerging trend of uh, 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 an, uh, antifungal resistance, we can also do an antifungal susceptibility test. And the importance of culture uh, uh, in a second analysis in the uh, uh, these uh, MUT1 and MUT2 trial, we have seen that the positive culture, which is done at the sixth day, has <coughs> is associated with a poor prognosis. So we can use this uh, point as a prognosticating factor uh, whenever we do a repeat, culture, a repeat uh, scraping in at six days, sixth day. In vivo control core microscopy is generally used uh, when we don't find any organism on culture. And but uh, this is usually, uh, uh, we can see you use confocal microscopy to look at different layers of the cornea. It's used to identify fungal hyphae. These are the, this is how the fungal hyphae would look as parallel uh, hyperrespective areas. And uh, the two specific patterns that have been identified with uh, in, uh, in vivo confocal microscopy with uh, fungal catatis is the presence of the reticulate uh, pattern in infiltration in angiostoma and the absence of stromal bullae in the angiostoma. These are the findings which are more associated with uh, fungal catatis in, in vivo confocal microscopy. The sensitivity and specificity is around 85 to 93%. The advantages of uh, confocal microscopy is an early diagnosis. Even it can be, uh, uh, fungus can be identified in culture negative or uh, uh, cases. And we can know the depth of the involvement and we can even uh, look at the efficacy of the drugs. And the disadvantage is it is very difficult to uh, do because already the patient is very symptomatic and it is a contact procedure. And the, and the uh, problem is the cost and availability. PCR again uh, is, uh, is a technique where we amplify the nucleic acid, uh, uh, nucleic acid amplification is done and we can identify even with a smaller sample size. And it has a very, fa it's a fairly good uh, uh, sensitivity and spe specificity, around 94 to 100%. And you can even uh, do a PCR even with a non-viable fragment and it can identify the fungi at the level of species. And again, the impression is cost and availability. This is a metagenome de deep sequencing where you analyze both DNA and RNA. And again, it, uh, the advantage of this is it gives uh, results within uh, minutes. This is a pure proteomics approach. Basically, it tells about how the, uh, the uh, eye is responding and uh, what are the different mechanisms it has. This mass spectrometry, used, which was earlier used mostly for bacteria, but now we can use it for uh, fungi as well. And the advantage is having a diagnosis in minutes. Treatment options, again, are more topical. Uh, oral and parenteral forms and injectables. These are the various antifungal agents that we can use. The basically, most common used antifungals are the polyins and azoles. And the polyins, the uh, most commonly used drug is natamycin, which is a drug of choice for all of the filamentous fungi. And it is the only USFDA approved uh, medication that can be that is used for fungal keratitis. And azoles are not used as a primary medication, but they can use as an adju adjuncts and in cases which are not responding to polyins. And uh, And amphotericin G can be used mainly for yeasts. Uh, these are the indications for oral antifungals where we uh, it's better to use anti oral antifungals when the infiltration is more than 5 mm, close to the limbus, greater than 50% depth, when you are having any sclerotis, endophthalmitis, when the infection is bilateral, and when you see a pediatric patient, impending perforations, and post keratoplasty infections. The, uh, the most commonly used medications are ketoconazole, itra, boriconazole, and posaconazole. Out of it, the uh, earlier three have a very, s uh, the ketoconazole has very small spectrum of activity, whereas boriconazole have a very broad spectrum of activity. And posaconazole is, is a relatively new drug, which is being uh, uh, evaluated, and it has a, a better safety profile. 
basically the mucosal cell treatment trial uh, in uh, trial 1 and trial 2 they evaluated natamycin versus voriconazole this is the natamycin versus voriconazole on topical treatment where the natamycin fared well and uh, voriconazole uh, oral therapy was substitute was given and no significant advantage was noted on using oral voriconazole but uh, the patients on oral voriconazole had higher rates of perforation this is uh, the basically the uh, uh, landmark article i would say landmark article because this has actually given a basic idea of how to manage a fungal keratitis what is the step step by step approach what should be the step by step approach so we still uh, uh, feel natamycin is the first line of therapy once we try natamycin uh, uh, topical for 7 to 10 days then if it's not res uh, and basing on the indication we would add the anti oral antifungals as well when the patient is not responding for 7 to 10 days then you would actually uh, add another uh, or antifungal of other group that is voriconazole then if it is still not responding after 7 days then we would think in other terms and they would we would go for a targeted therapy like intracameral or interstromal voriconazole if they are still not responding probably we'll go for a uh, therapeutic keratoplasty so these are targeted therapies which can be interstromal intracameral and intravitreal again in non non responding ulcers most commonly is the voriconazole and amphobi whereas the voriconazole is pretty safe amphobi has a lot of reactions it causes a lot of uh, anti chamber reaction it can cause weak vessels natamycin is recently being studied and natamycin with this um, uh, hydroxypropyl beta cyclodextrin is being evaluated and it is has so shown to have equal efficacy efficacy when compared to voriconazole the problem with intrastomal voriconazole is uh, the limitation and you can actually introduce a new foci as infection and uh, you can have an inadvertent inadvertent anti inter anterior chamber and some studies have shown no uh, not a significant role of uh, intrastomal voriconazole in uh, fungal keratitis what we need to understand is we need to have more clarity regarding the dosage of antifungals that are being used interval and the minimum maximum in the time of uh, number of injections that has to be given before we say that is no response to intrastomal voriconazole these are the different newer antifungals like i said fosconazole is the one which is being uh, uh, studied now and we are uh, the other antifungals are luliconazole and the canacandins mainly as adjuncts they better b work better on yeast and the disinfectants like hexamidin and podanidin can be used and nanoparticles are being used in, in the form of suspension of micelles liposomes and fibers in tubes to have a better uh, drug delivery into the anterior chamber so into the cornea and these are the various uh, fungus anti fungal susceptibility testing that is being done and uh, it is always better to understand what is uh, in the uh, susceptibility profile of uh, anti of, uh, of uh, fungal organism before we treat it the various uh, newer treatment modalities are contact lens based drug delivery system and uh, cross linking uh, for a non responding ulcer because it, it works by damaging the dna and rna and it increases the resistance of enzymatic degradation and increases the penetration of the antifungals but a trial conducted uh, uh, which is the cont uh, uh, shows there is no benefit but many other studies have shown there is a benefit beneficial role of uh, cross linking in case patients which are not responding to topical medication photodynamic therapy it again works on the similar mechanism of uh, uh, cross linking but we are using rose bengal and uh, a green light where it, uh, reactive oxygen is re uh, released and they uh, kill the fu fungus this is the basically the earlier uh, thing and the various surgical management we could discuss later thank you thank you dr arif uh, so praful uh, your paper is coming again and again on the screen <laughs> perhaps it's thank you again for quoting you that that is that we call tst protocol you know uh, the genesis of that article is you know you quoted mut 1 and mut 2 although these are landmark trials but you have to remember one thing the geographical variation and the organism's uh, susceptibility to different drugs differs depending to which part of the world you belong. So that study cannot be extrapolated to all cases of microbial keratitis. And if you uh, read those two articles and go for the subgroup analysis and uh, read uh, go through that, there are a lot of biases. So that's why we came out with the article where a general ophthalmologist how one should approach a case of fungal keratitis you know you can uh, you, you can't always base uh, plan your treatment based on your uh, it based on a result of a rct so but thank you again that is a very practical approach basically for a practicing uh, corneal surgeon any questions since uh, this was the last talk and uh, uh, so i just had a kind of a general i thought this way elicit a discussion so in the indian context uh, we see uh, here you have quoted 34% prevalence and there are studies which quote up to 45% prevalence meaning practically half of the ulcers that we see in, in our context are fungal. So are we justified in, in starting empirical treatment though clinically there are features which are 
which are very 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 significant of fungal phenotype chintan ma'am because i didn't talk anything i want to i want to talk now anyway so the floor See, is here fungal fung the medications used in these uh, fungal keratitis are they are very toxic they are very toxic to the eye surface so better to always confirm minimum diag minimum investigation we need to do is kvh yes. mark so once we confirm then only proceed with the kvh empirical i don't advise but we have a strong suspicion definitely we can start like there is nothing wrong it sometimes clinical picture look like clearly it's case of uh, there is a corresponding history a clear clear picture of fungal keratitis then there is nothing harm in starting if you don't have the facility but everybody should do at least minimum kohq that's what i request to everyone i will i will play the devil's advocate here now it's not uncommon in a tertiary setting to see patients who are presenting with say two weeks history of treatment with antibacterial and antifungal we know that only uh, parasites are two percent so shall we add add natamycin to say moxifloxacin see to no uh, my yeah i'll yeah I'll please uh, you finish yeah. your quota first natamycin also has bacterial antibacterial properties there is no need for any addition of moxifloxacin or any any other antibiotic when we are unless it is a purely proven case of mixed uh, infections so usually it's not required that's what i feel uh, now uh, yeah profula you can tell now <laughs> so natamycin do have antibacterial property but you have to understand that the strength 5% yes. at that strength it may not have antibactericidal activity so that is the issue uh, it may have some property but it some cannot take care of yeah. all the bacteria that is there in the cornea and starting antifungal you know uh, me sitting at rpc or ma'am at pj it's very easy for us to say ki please go for a kys then start antifungal but it's not always practically possible i think most of you would agree with me so in that case see the cases that we see these are primarily already on some form of treatment and then then they come to us so that time it's very difficult for us to decide based on clinical examination whether it is bacterial fungal but if you are the first contact physician then we will definitely find some classic signs of fungal keratitis and if you have those signs and you don't have facility possible to go for a kws stain so i don't find any harm in starting antifungal okay mm -hmm. but as i said if the conditions are like that is not possible at all there will be patient who will say jo dena yahi pe de deke jao i will not going and i will not be going to anywhere and i for those patient there is no harm but if you have accessibility for kws always you should go for kws then start because as sir rightly said all this antifungal drug they have epithelotoxic properties if you continue them for a long time then you will get confused whether this ulcer is because of bacteria or is it because of the drug induced i, I hope sir agree, agrees agree, with no, me no i agree agree with that so actually uh, the point of the discussion is that it is quite simple to diagnose uh, fungal keratitis all we need is a slide and uh, with dr varsha's technique of a trypan blue that that is even simpler if koh is still bewildering and Inhibiting second is, is microscope <laughs> <laughs> no no yeah it, it's a, it's yeah. a simple microscope yeah, it's like 10, a few I, I guess even the yeah. correct yeah i mean anybody who can have a mobile phone, mobile phone smartphone a basically yeah, should there is be in fact a paper right na people have yeah. taken <laughs> photograph with uh, yeah. smartphone the magnifying lens and they smartphone. could see those uh, fungal correct. element so no there is one that there are some definitive guidelines for the benefit of residents and practicing ophthalmologists that if the fungal ulcer appears fungal and the koh shows filaments and it is responding to antifungals then one can treat at a community level non tertiary level the fungal keratitis if it appears fungal but we do not get filaments on the slide then better to refer pediatric case better to refer yes sir if it is worsening better to refer if it is thinning about to perforate better to refer if it is large ulcer and appearing fungal then also it's better to refer because uh, again they may need any uh, ancillary surgical management so we have to work under these guidelines but having said that we need to understand that in our context in the meaning in the indian subcontinent 45% could be fungus uh, i will take some 
audience uh, here. Vasa ma'am wanted to say something. <laughs> ma'am, you uh, first. I have done a study on corneal abrasion going, bec uh, going into small ulcers and then larger ulcers. So I, uh, we have shown that if the corneal abrasion patient pr presents to any primary uh, center, within two days, 98% would heal. Of the remaining 2% who would go to secondary center, if the ulcer is small, more than 70% would heal with medical management. If required, very few would need PABC. That can be taken care of at any, I'm here, I'm here saying secondary center, that can be any general ophthalmologist or anyone. And if the ulcer becomes larger, then it's thera uh, therapeutic keratoplasty and other things, and the healing goes down. So the cost of treatment becomes more, outcome becomes poor as the ulcer size increases. So I would say that uh, if we have to say that we are going to put up these guidelines, maybe we have to say if the ulcer is less than two ulcers, you don't have facility, you can still start with empirical treatment, but if it's more than two millimeter, it's better to. Uh, In fact, do that that is what AO guidelines suggest. Any ulcer which is less than two mm size yes. and not threatening the visual axis, you can manage without going for a corneal scraping. Yes. Scraping is not so indicated. That should come out. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, ma'am, for bringing out that point. Uh, I just have uh, two points to make. Uh, one thing is uh, regarding that uh, what Dr. Arvind has told. Uh, sometimes it's also the technique of scraping is also important when you actually, sometimes the, you know, the clinical picture actually looks very typical of a fungal, but uh, it also depends upon who is doing the scraping and how they are doing the scraping. So it is very important that we reiterate to our PGs that scraping is not just a, you know, odd job and they just have to finish it, but it has a, so much uh, importance to it. Uh, so I think uh, the technique there uh, plays a lot of uh, importance because sometimes it's that uh, as sir told already, if we, you know, most of the beginners don't take off the debris and it's the debris which goes on to KOH first, the gra gram stain, you hardly get anything. And then after you, uh, there have been cases like you see, you are very sure that this is fungal and then you continue the fungal treatment and then the patient is scarring. And when you see the patient on two day follow up, Yes, you seeing that, you know, it is follow up. So you have to make sure that the basics are in a, a followed in the correct step. Uh, like, and we also have to make sure that whatever is done is correct, uh, done correctly. True. So that, that is, is very yeah. important. And I have one doubt uh, to all the people who are working in other tertiary centers like ma'am and PGI and you and AIMS and sir and LVC. Uh, what is your current uh, indication for... Um, uh, doing a collagen cross-linking in cases of uh, infectious keratitis? I, I don't do that. Yes. <laughs> so we are doing uh, uh, Vaxi XL in keratitis. Again, I would admit like uh, I, I'm personally not a fan of it. I've and uh, the things have, it you have to be very, very careful. It's a very large ulcer I've had. I've tried it a, a couple of times and burned my hand. You don't know when these ulcers which were okay and you do a Vaxi XL and they go into a melt. So that's been my experience that they go into a melt, and so which is why uh, they have to, uh, so they have to be limited non-responding. But you know, lesions which are very close to the limbus, large ulcers, they can backfire on you very badly. So I am myself, I would be not hesitant to admit that I, as yet, am not clear as to what you know is the ideal case for a cross-linking. So what uh, our practices we have, we did a study on this. In fact, CXL in uh, micro <laughs> in mycotic keratitis. In that, we did not find any benefit of uh, doing CXL in cases of fungal keratitis. With the basic logic, even if the ulcer appears superficial, your organism deep treated. So that's not going to help. The second is bacterial keratitis. So the evidence suggests if you have already used all your uh, options, like you have uh, gone for topical, you have got interstomal, everything, still there is no healing. Patient doesn't want a therapeutic PKP. Then there is no harm in doing CXL for such group of patient few studies they have shown wonderful results, dramatic results following CXL. So you can try that. But when you're doing CXL in keratitis, remember a common mistake that everybody does, they do a debridement. Don't debride at all. Whatever the ulcer area, you use that area only and do CXL in that particular area. Because there is a study from Irwin, if you have gone through that, that study was prematurely terminated. 
Why? Because all the patients where CX was done, three, four out of three, they, uh, they, they went into corneal perforation. So that study was terminated. The mistake was that only. If you do a 8 mm debridement and then do, then the chances of melting is high. So if you have to do something for a patient, then you can have that option with you. But we don't find any significant benefit of that. So what is having more what is having probably more promise in this field is the photodynamic therapy with uh, riboflavin. So that yes. again studies are in, in progress on that. Nowadays people what they are doing in fungal keratitis, they are not uh, cross-linking the disease cornea. But if you are planning a therapeutic PK, they are cross-linking the therapeutic graft. That, that may prevent the recurrence, that is the concept. I think some, uh, I think uh, in SN, I think there is a uh, multicentric study they are doing on this. Perilational oricanazole, what's your suggestion? Pe see, we use that again, as I said you, if you have already tried topical drugs, natamycin, then our after 14 days, oricanazole is not responding. You don't want to go for surgery. And in that case, you can try that. But um, the uh, and uh, sir, I think he sir highlighted all these points. One problem with voriconazole that we uh, that we realize is the bioavailability. You know the bioavailability of voriconazole in stroma is hardly in few seconds. So the moment you inject, within one minute the drug is gone. So we don't know how much it acts. But there are instances where we do get some clinical benefit. So if you have a ulcer deep seated and you don't feel that ki therapeutic PK is needed but topicals are not working, you can go ahead with that. But you have to ensure complete barrage is done all around the ulcer and you have to repeat it. It's not a one time procedure. You may have to repeat it two or three times at a gap of 24 to 48 hour interval. Then that may give you some benefit. It works in few patients. And uh, the two study that we published in one study, we got benefit in all our cases. In other study, we did not get any benefit at all. So it all depends on a lot of factor, patient factor maybe, but it will help. If you don't want to go for TPK, please go ahead with that. And it's a very simple procedure. You just need a 30 gauge needle and one ml syringe and voriconazole. So you can try that. And if you don't have voriconazole, you can use amphotericin B also. Amphotericin B is often the most ignored drug in uh, <laughs> mycotic keratitis, but that also works well. Yeah. Okay, so thank you very much. I was not expecting this much discussion in this <laughs> session, but thank you all. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Let's have a photograph. <laughs>